Traffic engineers get a lot of grief, but man, a lot of it is self-inflicted. Just look at this stuff. A look inside the bleeding edge of traffic design innovation and how it makes your life worse. Coming up next. This is City Nerd, weekly content on cities and transportation. Viewer suggested topics, always welcome. But here's another topic that I doubt anyone asked for. And if you did, I recommend someone does a welfare check on you. You see, in my day job, I worked with a lot of traffic engineers. They even let me do traffic engineering for a while, which was probably a mistake. And one thing that never ceased to amaze me was how engineers use their ingenuity to invent the most impractical, outlandish traffic configurations in an attempt to quote unquote solve congestion. You'd like to think these are just traffic nerd fantasies that never make it out of the simulation software, but sadly, some of these monstrosities are actually getting built. So what I'm gonna do today is take you on a tour of some of these innovative interchanges and intersections and give you my thoughts on them from the perspective of someone who's an urbanist but understands some traffic engineering. Let's set the table by looking at a very standard interchange configuration. This is I-5 running through North Portland. It dates from the 1960s and was built on the alignment of North Minnesota Avenue through several of what were historically black neighborhoods. It's pretty unsavory, but it's a typical freeway origin story. So this is the Diamond Interchange at North Rosa Parks Way. It's pretty much the most bare bones type of interchange that will still accommodate all the possible traffic movements. And this type of interchange is pretty ubiquitous on the interstate system and you can see why. It's relatively compact and it's predictable, meaning the signals at the ramp terminals essentially function the same way a signal at a typical urban intersection would. And it's not a lovely environment for people walking and biking, but the city and ODOT could have done a lot worse. There's buffered bike lanes, lots of kermit, and crosswalks at each signal. From there, conventional interchanges just get worse. Mostly they'll add loop ramps to take left turns out of the equation. And all of this is generally consistent with what's been the animating philosophy of traffic engineering since the profession was invented, which is to design the transportation system for the lowest common denominator driver who's apparently incapable of making a competent left turn at a traffic signal. Okay, let's get to our survey of amazing traffic innovations, starting with freeway interchanges. Now, if you want a more detailed analysis of how these different interchanges function, you can search YouTube and find all kinds of videos of fancy animations and simulations, usually from some state DOT that's trying to sell you on all the benefits. I'm going to use a real world example for each of these, and we're going to start at the Green Valley Parkway interchange on I-215 in the southern part of the Las Vegas metro area. Like all good suburban interchanges, the surrounding area is just loaded up with trip-intensive, car-oriented land uses, office parks, strip malls, high-end grocery stores, Mediterranean-themed casino resorts, Lifestyle centers, you know, I do roast lifestyle centers, but there's something to be said for the fact that developers actually do recognize that people want walkability. The finest in cuisine and restaurant architecture. Well, yeah, obviously this, but don't sleep on this one either. You know your search for authentic Cantonese food is complete when you find yourself in the presence of a pair of oversized terracotta horses. Anyway, Green Valley 215 is actually one that's easy for me to do a site visit, so that's what I did. This is called a Single Point Urban Interchange, or SPUI. First, let's talk about what this is and why state DOTs build them. If we go back to that I-5 Rosa Parks intersection, it's got two signals. What that means is that at congested times, you can potentially run into problems with coordination and progression between the signals, which can result in underutilized green time, which is a big traffic engineering faux pas. The SPUI solves this by consolidating all the movements to just one signal. Because of the way the geometry is set up, the left turns coming off 215 can go simultaneously and the left turns from the parkway onto 215 can run at the same time too. 
It's a simple clean operation, but there's always a catch. And in this case, there's no marked crossing across the parkway. That's because every phase at the signal includes a traffic movement that would conflict with pedestrian crossing. So yeah, it's pretty easy to design a quote unquote efficient signal when you don't have to account for pedestrians at all. Now the overcrossing itself does accommodate people walking, but it's a bit of an adventure. You have to hit three different call buttons on your way across the interchange. You have to navigate treacherous fields of rock debris. The section over the freeway is a walking environment I can only describe as prison yard chic. So yeah, pedestrians are accommodated, but a little tip for you. When you hear a traffic engineer use the word accommodate, the correct translation is, we cobbled together the minimum possible solution to a problem that we ourselves created. So if you wanna cross Green Valley Parkway, you have to walk a quarter of a mile out of direction. Like, if I want to get my intestinal tract scoped and then walk over to, I don't know, Claim Jumper for a light lunch, it should only be about 500 feet, but instead it's like half a mile. Maybe you think this still isn't a big deal, but I just point out that there's an otherwise pretty useful multi-use path that runs along the south side of 215, but you can't actually cross where the path comes out because of the interchange design. Instead, it sends you up a sidewalk to Village Walk Drive and then back down again. And for transit, the transit shelter designs and locations in Vegas are pretty wild. There's like three or four feet of clearance here from a 45 mile per hour seven lane arterial. I'd just point out that these signal cabinets or whatever they are, get a deeper setback from the arterial than the bus shelter does. It's just stupendous work. Okay, let's fly across the country to check in on Florida because I'm always a bit worried. This is the Lions Road interchange on Highway 869, the Sawgrass Expressway in Coconut Creek, a bit north of Miami. It's got all the quality interchange adjacent land uses you'd expect from Florida. And this is what we're calling a contraflow left interchange. What it means is as Lions Road approaches the interchange, the left turns split off and get channelized early. So when you get into the interchange itself, the left turn lanes are flipped. This takes some conflicting volumes out of each ramp terminal and improves operations. But again, there's a price you pay. No marked pedestrian crossing at either ramp terminal signal. So you have to go way up or downstream if you want to go to like Texas Roadhouse or LA Fitness. Eh, it's Florida. If you want real innovation, the pound for pound champ has to be the Missouri DOT. This is the I-44 interchange at Kansas Expressway in one of our nation's finest Springfields. Don't be fooled by the functional designation of the crossing arterial. Given the number of high intensity land uses and driveway cuts, I'm just gonna make up a new term and call it a strict expressway. This is a diverging diamond interchange or DDI. The traffic on the Strix Expressway flips sides as it passes through the interchange area. So again, you're removing conflicts at your left turns. The whole design is really optimized for a pedestrian free environment. And then it's like they kinda sorta accommodated pedestrians when they got to the end of the design. I mean, look at this. Curb tight sidewalk, and then you cross this weird concave polygon pork chop. And then, I love this, they put you right in the median of the overcrossing between two jersey barriers. Pedestrians accommodated, check. Quick aside, I roast the US for stuff like this, but my understanding is it really took French ingenuity to bring the DDI into the world. I believe this is one of the originals. It's the interchange of A13 and Boulevard de Jardis in Versailles, just outside of Paris. Just in case you were under the illusion that all of France looks like the 11th arrondissement. Okay, let's get into signalized intersections. And we'll set the table with a standard full movement intersection. This is State Road 7 and Forest Hill Boulevard in West Palm Beach. Still the signalized intersection with the most approach lanes that I've been able to find. Triple lefts, double rights, quad through lanes. It's a true alpha intersection. 
hit me up in the comments if you know of a bigger one anywhere, because I gotta know. Let's go to Arizona for our first innovation. This is the intersection of Ina and Oracle in Tucson, and the design is called a Michigan left. You free up capacity by prohibiting eastbound and westbound left turns at the intersection itself. And instead, you accommodate those movements by having cars drive straight through, then making a U-turn at a cut in the median, which requires two more signals, so that isn't cheap. Also, look at the chunk they had to take out of the north side of Ina to accommodate U-turns. Just awesome for the pedestrian environment. Also, you have to say, U-turns are fundamentally anti-urban, period. It's more vehicle miles traveled and the service of a very specialized definition of the word efficiency. Next, let's head to the home of this nation's widest arterials, the Greater Salt Lake area. On the plus side, having streets that were designed wide enough to U-turn an aircraft carrier means there's a lot of creative things you could do with the right-of-way to increase the livability. But we're going to check out Bangerter Highway, which is like a traffic engineer's hall of fame of misguided ideas and pedestrian hostile treatments. If you don't live in Salt Lake and you want to bask in some first-rate schadenfreude, just go into Google Maps and cruise down this corridor. You won't be disappointed. We're going to zoom in on the intersection with 171, though. Look at this masterpiece. It's called the Displaced Left Turn. We're going to add extra signals on the north and south side of the intersection, and we're going to cross all the left turning traffic over to the opposite side upstream of the intersection. Look at all the extra channelization and weird skip striping you need to make this work. And imagine trying to cross it as a pedestrian. Does you not design stuff like this during, I don't know, the ayahuasca ceremonies they have at agency retreats? I give it a 10 for creativity and a zero for practicality. Okay, I have one more wildly creative intersection concept to share and some amazingly perceptive insights on what all these treatments have in common and how we might go about restoring some sanity to our traffic design. But first, quick reminder to, well, vote if there's early voting in your state and drop a like on the video and subscribe if you're appropriately horrified by what you've seen in the video thus far. Hit up the Patreon if you want to support a channel that thinks it's not too much to ask licensed drivers to figure out how to take a left turn safely. And sub count check, hey, we hit 90,000 this week, and that means we get to fill a proper urban stadium, which is Wembley in London. Density, cranes in the air, multiple transit stations, it's a very welcome respite from SEC college football stadiums. Okay, let's do one more intersection concept. This is one that's been proposed many times, including on a project I worked on, but it's so bad that it's never actually been implemented, well, yet. This is the Bowtie intersection. This one's proposed in Manassas, Virginia, deep in the suburbs of DC, and it achieves its quote-unquote efficiency by, again, prohibiting left turns at the intersection itself and instead having cars drive through the intersection to a roundabout on the far side, which is built solely for the purpose of accommodating U-turns, so drivers can then pass through the intersection yet again to complete their left turn. Okay, the conceptual design here is really from the VDOT website, but it shows up in the forums for the website aaroads.com. AA Roads is a place for both road enthusiasts and general travelers to mingle and discuss a variety of subjects, yada yada, or find a road meet to attend near you. Okay, I gotta get this video finished real quick so I can get a road meet on my calendar. Check out this post, which I had to read at least three times before I could convince myself it wasn't actually being sarcastic. At some point in the near future, the people of Prince William County, Virginia will bear witness to a great revolution in traffic engineering. And it is a thing of beauty. I hope this is the beginning of a glorious revolution. Colonels 12 loves highways and cars, hates public transit. Yeah, that all checks out. Okay, so there's a common saying that's very applicable to traffic engineering. 
There are variations on it, but it's something along the lines of what gets measured is what matters or what gets measured gets managed. Meaning if you don't have a transparent quantitative performance measure for something, then you're rarely going to see it get accounted for in design. Key performance indicators or KPIs come naturally to traffic analysis. Delay per vehicle, intersection volume to capacity ratio, 95th percentile vehicle queue length. These are the measures people are looking at when they come up with these cubist looking traffic designs. My thought is, if you have an opportunity to get in someone's ear about an interchange that's getting reconstructed or constructed, ugh, ask them what their KPIs are for the ped and bike environment. Because if they don't have them, or if they're an afterthought, it's just going to reinforce the cycle of car dependency. Of course, my preferred solution is just don't have freeways. Here's what the interchanges in two of the continent's most vibrant urban areas look like. Manhattan, below 125th Street, just doesn't really have interchanges unless you count the bridge and tunnel portals. In Vancouver, BC, you have to go way on the periphery to find one, and when you get there, the interchange consists of a freeway running below grade with the ramps running at surface level and converging on, well, sort of a strody intersection, but at least it isn't a full interchange. There are a couple of boring standard type interchanges too, but you know, this video is boring enough as it is. And that's all I've got. Thanks for joining today, and thanks to the patrons for funding my field visit lunch, which consisted of some soothing lettuce wraps and Chang's spicy chicken. Keep the great topic suggestions coming. I'll be back with a new episode next week, and I'll see you then.